All right, let's dive into the very important concept of gradients. So in machine learning, you often want to minimize some loss function. For example, in linear regression, that was the mean squared error. And in logistic regression, we saw that there was the binary cross entropy. So a very key function when trying to minimize any um, objective is its gradient. And the grade is basically just the multivariable version of the derivative. And for optimization, it has sort of three key properties, which I'm going to try to demonstrate to you in this section. The first is that it provides a linear approximation to a function, just like the derivative does in scalar functions. And what's important for optimization is that whenever you're at what's called a local minima, the gradient is zero. So if you want to try to minimize a function, you want to find places where that gradient is zero. And the way we find that is from the final property, which is that at all other points, the negative of the gradient provides the direction of maximum decrease. Okay, so with these properties in mind, let's start off with just defining what we mean by a gradient. So in a gradient, you have, or at least what we're going to describe here, are gradients of scalar valued functions. So for example, we have an f. It takes a vector of inputs, so it can have one or more inputs, but it's scalar valued, so it only has one output. And I'm going to give you lots of examples in a second. Now, whenever you have a vector input, the gradient is just itself a vector with each component being the partial derivative of that function with respect to each of the components. So if W has n components, the gradient will have n components, one for each of these components. We're going to um, talk just very briefly about it here, um, but it's a little more advanced. You can even have a matrix input. For example, say W is the size m by n, in that case, the gradient will be the matrix of all the de partial derivatives. In particular, in either case, the gradient is always the size as the input argument. In, so if W is a vector, the gradient's a vector of the same size. And if W is a matrix, the gradient's also a matrix. Now, let's just do some quick, simple examples to illustrate. Here's the most simple one. Uh, you have a function that has two inputs, w1 and w2, and it has a scalar output just given by this toy formula. This formula doesn't have any real value, just something to illustrate how to compute a gradient. So if I asked you to compute the gradient, all you do is you compute these two partial derivatives. Now, if you forget how to compute partial derivatives, it's actually super easy. All you do when you're taking the partial derivative with respect to w1, you just treat w2 like it's a constant. So the derivative of w1 squared is 2w1, and the derivative of 2w1 w2 cubed is just 2w2 cubed because all this thing is just treated like a constant. Similarly, the partial derivative with respect to w2, this one is constant with respect to w2, and this one here will just be 6w1 w2 squared. If this sounds a little difficult, just go ahead and review your undergraduate calculus and should be able to get back up to speed pretty quickly. Now that you've computed these two partial derivatives, all the gradient is, is just a vector with the two partial derivatives in each component. So what this does is it takes for every w1, w2, it generates a vector um, with these two components. If you um, wanted to write a Python function, which we'll have to do to do numerical optimization to implement the gradient, we could do it like this. I'm going to take a function and it's going to have this input argument x. Just because Python starts in zero, I've relabeled w1 to w of zero. 
and w of w2 to w of 1. So the first line will just compute the function, which is just implementing this. And the second bunch of lines computes the gradients. I just compute the gradient with respect to w0 and 1. And then I just pack it into an array, and I could return that. And then if I wanted to evaluate this, I put some input, like 2, 4, and then I get this gradient and the function. Note the function is a scalar, but the gradient in this case is a vector. All right, let's next look at an example which is at least a little more relevant for machine learning. So suppose we had a model for data with two parameters. So each uh, prediction for the target y hat i has uh, two parameters in this kind of exponential model, a and b. So I'm just going to call that parameter vector w. And then one natural way to try to fit that uh, those parameters is to maybe use a mean squared loss like this. And I've just put a, a constant factor half, which will simplify some of the calculations, but you don't have to have that. OK, now we suppose we want to compute the gradient of this loss function. So how do we do that? It's pretty simple calculus. Remember that the first thing you have to do is you have to compute the derivative of j with respect to both a and b. So let's do dj dA. So the first step in that is just to use basic linearity. So that means that I'm going to take that dj dA and move it inside the sum. That's all this first step does. The next step is just, well, to use chain rule. Remember that d um, of anything dA, uh, d of anything squared dA will just be 2 times that thing times the derivative of the inside. So that's all I did. The 2 canceled out with that half. And now I have d y hat i dA. But the last part is easy. I can just get that from here. And that will be e to the minus b x i. I can play the same trick for d, j, d, b, and I get the exact same expression, except that when I get to d, y hat, i, d, b, I just get this expression here. Now I have d, j, d, a, d, j, d, b, and I can just put them into a vector, and I have the gradient. If I wanted to implement that in Python, here's one way to do it. I have a vector w, we're just going to unpack these two parameters, a and b. Then I'm going to compute this difference, which is y minus y hat. I can get the value of the function by taking the sum. And then here are the Python code to take the derivatives of the two components. There it is, just the sum of that difference minus the exponents. And then I pack them into a vector, and I return j and j grad, and that is it. Now, to go on to the next example, I need to talk about something called chain rule. So you all know chain rule for scalar functions. In fact, we just used it here in example two. And just as a recap of that, what we did is that you have something in chain rule called a composite function. So a composite function is just um, one function after another. So like you take an input x, then you pass it through one function g, and take g of x, and pass it through a next function f. You could write it, if you like, as saying, I'm going to say that I'm going to take x, it's going to create a variable z, and then from z, I'm going to take it like y. And that's going to create, if you like, this chain of dependencies, if you wanted to visualize it graphically. Now all chain rule says is that if you want the derivative of the output from the input x, you can do it one step at a time. You can take dy dz times dz dx. Or if you like, you can write it in terms of the original functions. So just as an example, we could have um, say y is equal to log of z and z is equal to cos of x. Just some example, it doesn't really matter. So if I wanted to do this, dy dx is dy dz 
times dz dx, which in this case will be 1 over z times minus of the cosine of x. You could leave it like that, or if you wanted to, you could substitute z equals cos of x and get this expression here. Now, if this sounds unfamiliar to you, there's a really, really good um, lesson with exercises at the Khan Academy, which will review all of this for you. Now, what I want to do here is sort of generalize this to multivariable composite functions. So in this case, I have some function j, and it's a function of not one z, but multiple z's. And each z is in turn a function of a bunch of variables, w. And I want to compute the derivatives of the j's with respect to the w's. So in this case, we can visualize this graphically like this. I have a bunch of w's. There's some dependencies which create the z's. And then the z's create the j's. And in this case, if you want to find the derivative of j with respect to w, you can use what's called the multivariable chain rule. And it basically is the same thing as the scalar one with a sum. It tells you this. If you want to find the derivative of j with respect to w, j, like little j, I just um, take the partial derivative of j with respect to each one of the intermediate variables, and then take the partial derivative of that intermediate variable with respect to wj. And I add all the contributions together. So this is the basic idea. I'm going to just apply that technique now on a slightly more complicated problem. So suppose you had a model like this. I had n data samples. Each has a record x, i, which is a vector and some target yi. But the model I wanted to fit was of the following form, that y hat i is the logarithm of zi, and zi is some linear combination of this. You could call this like a log linear model. And I want to then fit some mean squared error cost. So how would I do this? So first thing I want to do is I want to compute the partial derivative of j with respect to wj. But this is nothing other than our multivariable chain rule. But before we do this, we're going to do just one, a couple of things to make the notation simpler. First, I'm going to define a matrix like I always do, A, which will have a ones in the first column. And if I do that, each zi, I can just write as a summation over the terms aij times wj. This is just like we did in um, linear regression. And it's also what we did in logistic regression as well. All right, now with this, it's super easy to apply the multivariable chain rule. I just go dj dwj is our sum over every intermediate variable of dj dzi times dzi dwj. This one here, I'm actually going to use just regular chain rule to break that up. dj dy hat i times dy hat i dzi. And now it's easy. Just look at this. dj dy hat i will just be, that only dependency will be from this term. So it'll be 2 times y hat i minus y i. Then dy hat i dz i, which is 1 over z i. And from this relation here, we see that dz i dw j is a i j. And now I have an expression that I need. I want to just show you that it's in these kinds of problems, you can implement them in using matrix multiplies. And that's very good for an efficient Python implementation. So to show this, I've just first copied the three equations we had from the previous slide. We have zi's in terms of the a's, the y hat i's are in terms of this uh, log of i, and then we have this derivative here, uh, like this. So we can easily implement this in matrix notation. 
all I do is I say, well, Z is just like a matrix multiply, the Z vector, because that's all this is, matrix multiply of A and W. The Y hat I will just be the log of the Z. That's just this, assuming that the log is applying it component-wise. And then this expression here, I first compute these, these, this guy here um, as Y hat I minus Y divided by this, with the understanding that this is element-wise division. And then, if I take that whole expression and multiply it by aij and sum over the i's, that's the same as multiplying by the transpose of that matrix. So now I don't have any indices, and it's just all matrix uh, multiplications. You can implement that very easily in Python, like this. First two lines here, are just going to create that matrix with a ones in the first column. And then the next lines here are computing these parts. The Z is A times W. Y hat is the log of the Z. And the J is the sum of those um, components squared. And the gradient is just this. DJ, DZ is this expression. And then the gradient is the transpose times the multiple of this. So in just a few lines of Python, you can implement this gradient. And we'll show how to then use this if you want to try to fit the, this model. Now, a couple more points um, I want to talk about for gradients. So now that we understand what they are, remember I said that there were three key properties. The first is that the gradients provide a linear approximation to functions. Let's recall what happens in the scalar case. So in the scalar case, I have a function f of x, and it's a scalar input x. If you remember from Taylor's series, that if you take an x that's close to x naught, it can be approximately written as f of x naught plus the derivative at that point times x minus x naught. So if I fixed x naught and look at this as a function of x, this is a linear function in x. And if you recall, that's just a tangent line. So here is um, f of x in red. And what this is doing is kind of finding a linear approximation, which will be accurate in the vicinity of the point where you took the derivative. And that f prime of x naught is kind of the slope of that linear approximation. Question then is what is the equivalent to this for vector valued inputs? And that, it turns out, is the gradient. So for this, suppose we have a function that doesn't have one but p inputs. So it's a vector valued input. And I fix a point x naught, whose components I'm going to write as x naught one to x naught p. Turns out that the gradients can be used um, as follows. If I have any other vector x close to the vector x naught, it'll be approximately given by this, which is the derivative of each component times the difference between the components. Or in other words, the inner product of the gradient with that difference. This again is a linear function in x, all right. Um, in fact, you can write it here as that difference as being a gradient here times x minus x naught. So that is the um, uh, that is what we mean by it being a linear approximation. Now, before I go on to the other two properties, one super important aspect of this property is that you can use it to check the gradients. Now. Even really good developers, even myself, um, when I write gradients by hand, if I do need to write them, I invariably must make mistakes because it's easy to lose a sign, to lose a constant factor. So I tell students to always check your gradients before you use them. And the best way to check them is to use this property, this linear approximation property. So what you do is I, I always do this. I take some random point, w naught, and I evaluate the function and its gradient at that point, assuming I have an implementation which I think works for this. And then I take some other point which is close to w naught, 
w1 and I evaluate the function at that point. And if my linearity property is correct, I should see that the change in the function from w0 to w1 should be equal to the inner product of the gradient with that difference. So for example, if I go back to that log linear function that I wrote, I would write a little test like this. I would generate some random data. In this case, I have x, w0, and y. And I would then um, evaluate the function and its gradient at w0. And then take another w1 that is very close to w0. So I have this little step size parameter, and it perturbs it in this uh, kind of random direction. And then I evaluate the function and its gradient at the new point. And then I want to make sure that the difference dj j1 minus j0 is roughly equal to that gradient times the w1 minus w0. And in this case, you know, they're extremely close. So they're only different here because at some point, as the difference gets larger, the second order terms matter. But you get something that's close. So always, always, always check your gradients before you use them. Now, we have two more properties that are important about gradients. The first is that at any stationary point, um, the gradient is zero. And what do we mean by a stationary point? Stationary, uh, well, sorry, a stationary point by definition is any point where the gradient is zero. That means all the components are zero. And the key property is that any local minima or local maxima is a um, stationary point. All right, so for example, here um, I have a scalar valued function, so the gradient is just a derivative. And you see here that I have what's called a local maxima. Local maxima just means in this neighborhood, it's the largest point. There might be some other point that's even higher up, All right? In some neighborhood, this is the largest point, and this indeed you can see that the gradient is zero. Similarly, here at a local minima, you see that the gradient is also zero. Now we use that, for example, in um, linear regression. We took the function to be the um, mean squared or um, RSS loss function, and then set the gradient equal to zero, and then solve for w. But as we saw in the logistic regression case, we can't often explicitly solve for that. And that's why we're doing this whole lecture on numerical methods. But nevertheless, um, it's true that when you're at a local minima, the gradient will be zero. The second or the third and final property is that the gradient always points in the direction of maximum increase. Now, just to see this, um, imagine you start at some point x0, and I move from x0 in a direction u, which is kind of just a small step, and I look at the change of the value of the function. So that will look like f of x0 plus u minus f of x0. But using our linearity property, that is just the inner product of the gradient with the step. But remember that the inner product is just written as the um, norm of the two vectors times the cos of the angle between them. Now, if I um, want to, if I want to maximize this, I want to make cos of theta equal to one, which means that I want to align u along the direction of the gradient. So, it'd be like this. Similarly, if I want to maximize the decrease, I would make cos of theta equal to minus one in which case I'm picking you along a negative direction of this. We can kind of visualize it here. So suppose there are these contour curves like this. Imagine you're like looking at a map and I want to go in the steepest descent. It will be in that tangent along this of these uh, contours. It's what this gradient is pointing us to. If you want, you can visualize it this way too. Here's the surface. The gradient is always pointing in the maximum increase. And if similarly I look in the negative direction, I'll get the direction of maximum decrease. All right, with that in mind, I think we've done everything you need uh, to do. Um,
try out this in simple in-class exercise. It's a kind of simple case. We're going to do a model with a couple of three parameters. I want you to code up the gradient for this and test it out. Once you're done with that, I think you'll be pretty comfortable with gradients and we can move on to talk about gradient descent.